Well, hello, everyone. This is Troy Basham, along with Heather Sumlin, and we are here with a man of many accomplishments. So how do you become successful just by anything and everything you want to do? We're going to find out because we have Lucas Pinkert here with us. Oh, man. And he is young, attractive, (laughs) and extremely successful, but taken. Wow. Just to let y'all know. It's very high billing. I don't know that I deserve all that. We have Lucas on because a lot of people ask us, look, the mental game specifically applies to sport, but over time you realize that applies to everything in life, especially mental management. Yeah. You know, when people read with one of your mind, they ask us, or they tell us rather, man, this applies to everything I do, whether it's school, business, work, relationships. It's just not sport, even though, you know, our dad was basically using it for specific sport. And so... Heather and I were talking, and I said, you know, what would be cooler than to have Lucas on because he's done so many things. So to give you an idea, I've known Lucas for 10-plus years now. Yeah, yeah, right around there. It's been been a while. And he was a mentor for my youngest daughter. That's how we first first met. He was a youth pastor at uh, uh, First Baptist Church in Lake Dallas. Really helped her going through her high school challenging years. Not only that, you were competing in – bodybuilding slash strongman contests mm-hmm. before that you were in a band we're going to get to to that of you know travel around the world yep as a bass player guitarist singer just about all, all of that yeah and then and now you're the lead pastor of the uh, first Baptist church at lake dallas and it is probably one of the i was going to say the but i want to be accurate i want to be lying but i know it's one of the fastest growing churches in the metroplex this is true, yeah. Percentage wise, we're we're up there, and so I'm going to say it has a lot to do with a you and your leadership. But as we're talking about, okay, how do you use mental management in these different aspects? You're like, Are you kidding me? You use it the same way in everything. It's like getting ready for a sermon. I got to do X Y Z when I'm performing. I got to do X Y Z, and now you got a podcast that's growing. Yeah, that's true. The Reverend and the Reprobate podcast is is moving up pretty quick. We actually found out we're number thirty in Honduras, so. For all the Hondurans wow. who are listening, thanks. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, but that's really cool. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's and there's an like 36 factoid. people that live in Honduras. That's amazing. Yeah. So that means at least 10 of them are listening. So we got that many that are that are locked in. Wow. Yeah, they actually have a ranking system in Honduras. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Apple IT or Apple Podcast ranks everybody, and and right now in Honduras, we're we're number 30. Well, let's let's start with this. Let's let's go backwards okay. then, because basically okay. the podcast thing is the latest thing. Yeah, that's You've the got newest. A, a edition. couple of spinoffs that I, I want to get to, but mm-hmm. first, just update us on the idea and what it's about. That concept of the podcast. No, oh, the idea of the podcast. So um, during the pandemic, uh, m- one of my best buddies, Danley, and I realized that uh, we couldn't get out. There were a lot of things that we weren't able to do. And one of the the biggest things that, that he and I got locked into doing was kind of the day-to-day minutiae of handling the business side of both of our, our jobs. So as, as pastor, I'm not only preparing sermons, but there's a large business side of things and said, you know, you, as a nonprofit, there are certain requirements and things that we have to meet in order to keep that status. And then on top of that, since we're funded completely by donations, uh, the bills and stuff that we have to pay when you don't have people in person um, starts to really pile on. So as we were navigating those waters and trying to figure out, you know, w- do we uh, apply for certain um, things with like the PPP loans and, and grants and that kind of stuff, we just, both of us would talk on the phone and we were lost in the minutia of everything that was going on and talking to attorneys and trying to figure out, you know, what we, we can and can't uh, apply for, what kinds of services we, we are and aren't able to do. And neither one of us were really able to flex our creative muscles. And so we were trying to just determine, you know, what's a way that we can do this? And we both, um, we liked talking to each other. When we hung out with people, we tended to, the two of us really had the knack to just kind of make everybody laugh um, because we've got a good friendship and we're just kind of ridiculous. And so we were like, you know what, why not start a podcast? And after the first few episodes we recorded, nothing aired. And uh, we just listened back to him to try to figure out whether or not the idea had any legs. Like, is this good? Is it funny? We sent it to a few friends of ours, and they were like, you know what? It, it sounds like we're just sitting around hanging out with you guys. We we loved it. And then it kind of morphed when we realized that there were people that we could just send an email to that would come on the podcast. And so now the 
I, I guess our our subheading is uh, the Reverend and the Reprobate. You know, two best buds talking to people that are interviewing people that they have no business talking to, and that's really what it's turned into. I mean, we've interviewed New York Times bestselling authors, political pundits, uh, a lot of comedians. Troy Basham. Um, yeah, Troy Basham. Uh, we've interviewed a few reality TV show stars, which has been really fun. Uh, last night we interviewed a Radio Hall of Famer who just sat down and you know came into the studio, talked with us. Uh, comic book artist. We've got some. Um, stuntmen, historical weapons, recreation specialists. Like we've, That's we've had so this huge cool. gambit of, yeah, all these in, incredible people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, lots of comedians. And then um, coming up, we've got a guy that has uh, a million followers on Facebook and his name, he's from Scotland. Uh, his tag on, on, uh, sorry, a million followers on YouTube. His tag on YouTube is the hoof GP and he's a, a cow hoof trimmer. And so he trims cow's hooves, finds abscess, and like drains them. He's like Dr. Pimple Popper for cow hooves. <laughs> and his channel, it's, it's totally gross. Like my wife can't watch any of it. Um, but Dan Lee and I, for whatever reason, we're fascinated by it. So we shot him an email. We're like, hey, do you want to come on the show? And he's like, yeah, we'll have to do it, you know, late my time, but like, you know, mid afternoon for y'all. And since they don't celebrate Thanksgiving in the UK, we're doing it the week of Thanksgiving. So we got a guest and we're going to talk to him about cow hooves and how that yeah. became an internet phenomenon what so it's, it's just been crazy i'm thankful this guy that does cow hooves mm -hmm. yeah that's that's exactly right you know we're we're happy that that he's going and, and coming on the show and you know you talk about how do you apply mental management to all these these different areas well i read with winning in mind on your recommendation when i was prepping for uh the arnold classic which is uh, um, a big international uh, strength and bodybuilding show so i was prepping for that in 2019 and I uh, was going to compete to be the strongest man in the world under 200 pounds. And so as I'm preparing for that, I, I read with winning in mind, I, I do my best to try to read um, at least a book a month. And in 2019 and 2020, I was on pace to do a book a week and was just flying through stuff. Well, when I read with winning in mind, I, it stopped me down a little bit. Because I could, I could do cardio and I could fly through the book or I could really absorb the principles. And so I decided to do that. And I realized that the principles within Winning in Mind are applicable to so many different areas. And then when I followed it up with your book, Attainment, I was able to now take some of the principles that I learned with Winning in Mind, give them a little bit of shape and contour and, and apply those things in, in a lot of areas in day to day. Well, w what it looks like with podcasting is you know trusting the process making process primary so you know do we have um people that we're interested in that we've lined up do we have the emails that we're ready to you know to send out are we following those processes and then when you get into the interview because the email to get somebody on the podcast that we use is only it's only like two lines it's mm -hmm. hey um you know whoever like with uh, the hoof guy that we're we're mm -hmm. having on next week Hey, Graham, really love your YouTube channel. We're in Texas with a lot of cattle ranchers. We'd love to have you on the show. Are you interested? Thanks, Lucas. And that's the whole email. And he responds to it. And obviously now we, we've got him on the show. So there's, there's the process of figuring out which guests you want, then lining them up, then scheduling the guests, and then the process of research. And the process of research for me is the, is the best part because I love learning about new things. You know, you kind of jokingly talked about all the different things that I had. I'd done in my life and how I, um, you, the question you asked, how are you successful in all of them? And so much of it has to do with, with research and practice that, that rehearsal aspect of it. You know, you, you see a lot in with winning in mind, uh, especially as Lanny's talking about his story, you know, he had a, a couple of years where he couldn't go to the range. Mm -hmm. And so he's, he goes into this room that he's got set up and he rehearses what it's like to shoot at the range over and over and over again. And so that's one of the things that, that we do uh, for the podcast is we, we do the research and then we set up the questions and rehearse how you go from one question to another. What are your segues going to be like? How do you keep somebody engaged? And that really helps because there's a little bit of um, imposter syndrome whenever mm -hmm. you, you sit down with somebody, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in person, that you don't feel like you should be with. And I experienced the same thing in athletics. I've experienced the same thing as a pastor. You know, when I, when I was an athlete and I was competing against the guys who I had watched growing up 
or I was sharing a stage, even though we were in different classes and different categories, with you know the the first bodybuilding competition that I won was the Mr. Southwest in two thousand five. And it was this And tell everyone your nickname. Uh, my favorite uh, one. You actually wh- have two. Which, which one? Uh, I got Pocket Thor and Mini Hulk were two that were yeah, so I combined the two. There. I like yeah. Mini Thor. Mini Thor. <laughs> Mini I Thor. like Mini Thor. <laughs> yeah. So um but but Pocket when I was Thor. Yeah, Pocket Thor is great. Uh when when I stepped on stage, I'm there as one of the winners, but I'm on stage with guys who are competing for Mr. Olympia. And these are guys who like I'm at the time I was uh five eight. That hasn't changed, still five eight. <laughs> um but I was I was hundred and ninety pounds and was right around three percent body fat. It's not a healthy place to be, but if you do it for a little while, you know, that's part of the part of the gig for the competition. Well I'm standing next to a guy who in a couple of months is gonna compete for the Mr. Olympia title, the best bodybuilder in the world. He's actually gonna place in the top five. He's five four and three hundred and fifty pounds at the same percentage of body fat. Like I look like a toothpick mm-hmm. compared to this guy. And not only that, at five eight, I'm towering over him because this I mean, he's just a ball of muscle. And so there's this imposter syndrome that you have which really hurts your self image or it can damage your self image. Mm-hmm. Well the same thing as a young guy, as a thirty six year old going into a room of the pastors where I'm one of the younger pastors. And not only that, I'm I'm probably one of the few in a lot of the rooms that I go into that doesn't have a master's of divinity. I don't have, uh, you know, a PhD level education whenever I walk in there as far as religious studies and things go. So in those rooms, you know, being with those guys and talking to those guys, serving on the same boards and committees and panels mm-hmm. as we're trying to solve problems in the community and, and trying to figure out how to help out our, our neighborhoods and our county and things like that. There's there's certainly an imposter syndrome there because, it, you know, what is it like to be at the table with those guys? And then, you know, the same thing doing these interviews where we're sitting across and, you know, with the tagline, two guys that are talking to people they have no business talking to. That really is it. We were talking to, to David Baker, who has a, a show on the History Channel. He's a judge on, on the show Fortune and Fire, one of the most successful shows the History Channel's ever done. He's a historic weapons recreation specialist. He's, you know been with and and hung out with who's who of Hollywood and is is doing some of the coolest stuff we've ever been heard of you know and he's he's talking to us like he's a buddy of ours and uh, it's these these very surreal moments where you have to if you haven't done the preparation to be in those places where the the self-image and and those kind of things can just crush you that imposter syndrome can get the best of you and just completely bowl over all of the work and everything that you've done, which is why, you know, again, with Winning in Mind was such an impactful book because in each one of these areas, in each one of these aspects, I'm able to take the preparation that I've done, trusting the process, allowing the work to be able to run in my subconscious because I know the material, I I know the events that I'm going to do, I know the exercises, or, you know, we've done the research to ask the questions, we've run through the segues that Whenever my conscious mind is able to be in there to to catch up, to be engaged in listening, to to work with follow up questions, my subconscious has already run through all of this stuff and and knows what to do, and so therefore I've got a lot of confidence going into it, and I'm able to really keep those three circles in balance in in every one of those areas. It has been for me a book that has been um, I I don't know if if to say that it's life changing. Um, you know, in in the sense that you know the Bible was life changing for me, obviously, right. but it it has completely altered the way that I think about and that I do absolutely everything. So the way you go into things have changed since re- reading it. So we can really look at what you're talking about: preparation, trusting what you yeah. know, and competing through it. Whether it's a podcast, whether it's a competition, whether it's a sermon, right? So basically, would you say that you're kind of like master of the preload? I'm I'm working to become that. That's that's the goal is is to get there, you know. And and some of the other tools that you guys have provided really have been game changers as well. I mean the the performance journal is one that I use all the time. Um, so so is green your favorite color then? Uh, green green, green is not journal? my my favorite my uh, my favorite color. I have a blue journal. Okay, so mm-hmm. so, so we can eliminate yeah. mini hawk. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So yellow is my favorite color. <laughs> so. though. has been has been since I was a, a little kid. But that that journal has become a really important tool for me uh, in the evaluation process, 
when I, I preach a sermon, I go back and I use the journal, like what things did I miss? What did I do? Well, what, you know, what didn't hit so well? What in my preparation, um, can I do better for next time? And then ending again with some of the positive reflections and things that I can, I can carry on the same thing. We do the same thing with our podcast. We listen back mm-hmm. to it and we make the same notes based on the outline of the journal. When I, when I train for, uh, hopefully we'll be, be able to compete again. I had a couple of surgeries I had an ACL surgery and a double mastectomy and back to back years, which is kind of taking me out of strongman competition, but hopefully in Lord willing in 2022, be able to, to get back into some of those things you know, that journal is going to become part of the the day to day again and and fixing those things and, and really evaluating them so that in the next time when we get back into the preload, now I can look back and say, all right, these are the things that I need to work on. These are the things that I've done well and reset all, all of my thinking, you know, going back into the training session so that on a day of competition, I'm that much better. Yeah, it really so, is a circle, huh, Heather? You know, mm-hmm. you've got the the system is designed. You got your preparation. You got your action. Mm-hmm. But the evaluation set you up for what? the next preparation mm-hmm. and, right. and so on and so forth. So before Heather jumps in, because i got to ask you about sermons. Sure. When you're evaluating sermons, you're looking through, how much do you feed off what you see, the reactions from the people in the audience? You know, it's about a, a 50-50, and I'm glad you asked this question because some of it is feeding off the reactions of the audience. But uh, one of the things I learned from a lot of our, our comedians that we've, we've talked to, and, and Steve Martin talks a lot about this, and he's got a whole class on uh, public speaking mm-hmm. that he does. And one of the things he talks about is doing things that you know build a setup and then that people anticipate, but also about not reacting to the crowd. And that's really important, especially for his brand of comedy. If you've you know seen some of the stuff that um, that he did, especially in the '70s when he was kind of a rock star as far as comedians go, there were so many things that he did that were off-putting for the audience. You know, he would come out and do something completely absurd. You know, wore a, a, a hat with an arrow that looked like it was coming through his head and playing the banjo and doing all kinds of things that the audience wasn't expecting. And so, when you're doing things that the audience isn't expecting, if you're waiting for the audience to react, it's going to be different reactions every night. One of the things about preaching in particular is that when we were doing two services, the early morning service and the late morning service would react completely differently. Some points may land one, you know, in, in one service better than they did in the other. Some of it has to do with my delivery. Some of it has to do with how awake the, the congregation is. How but, much coffee they've had. Yeah, how much coffee they've had. But there's there's another element to it. And that is when something happens in the crowd that is distracting. If, uh, you know, a, a crowd's babies. reaction, yeah, babies are, are uh, definitely a big one. Uh, when people's cell phone rings, mm-hmm. um, we've, we've had a... that happen. Well, we, I was doing a youth event not too long ago, and we had a, a young man who had Tourette's who was in the audience. And so he can't control the fact that he's making noises mm-hmm. and... Um, he's he's making some gestures, and so the seats beside him are empty because he has a difficulty with limb control. Mm-hmm. And if I'm focused on that, then nobody told me that going up onto the stage or or you know going into the event. So whenever he starts to to make noises or whenever he starts to move his limbs, and in ways that are distracting to all of the rest of the crowd. I have the opportunity either now I can acknowledge and, you know, allow that to distract me. But if I'm prepared, if my mental process is on game, then my subconscious can run through all of that stuff and keep me on track while my conscious mind is processing. Hey, don't focus on this. Stay with what you're doing so that I can think about continuing to scan, making good eye contact and then moving on to the next point Mm -hmm. at the same time while keeping everybody else on pace and preventing them also from being distracted by that because that guy deserves as much to to be there and to have a good presentation as everybody else does Absolutely. because he can't control any of that stuff so there's there's a certain amount of of uh, crowd reaction that allows you to riff off and and to be a little bit uh, improvisational but the preparation side also does a tremendous amount with preventing you from being distracted if something does happen that you can continue on and, and push through and keep everybody engaged in spite of the distractions yeah the rehearsal part is definitely key Mm-hmm. And you're probably doing a little bit of contingency with what if this happens or this happens from those experiences, which sure. makes the imprinting of the rehearsal part and the preparation even more effective. Yeah. Because now when I go into it, I'm pretty much, I'm good to go. 
with no matter what happens in that. So I always thought it was it was interesting because preaching is a little bit more. You know, people are kind of serious in the audience; they don't want to disrupt anything. Also, depends on which you know service you go to. Yeah, you know, and, and some subject a matter, more engaging yeah. and that kind of stuff. To where you're gonna have some people you know, yell on amen, and other people just kind of quiet, you know, kind of right. stuff. And but when you get a few of them to where like people are really into it, and you could just see and kind of feel, you know, the audience kind of like, okay, I'm into it. Right. Even though they're not saying anything, you can, you look to the side and you can see, okay, they're paying attention, they're paying attention. And there's other days where you can tell that people are just not, but it's an important topic to hit on. So I was curious to see how that preparation would be. But it's interesting where no one told you about that one guy and you had yeah. to go there and make, and make a pre- presentation, you know, as good as, you know, normal. Yeah, yeah. And I've got 45 minutes. So it's not like this is a, a five minute talk where I can just you know get off stage after five minutes and be like, hey, what's what's going on with the guy in the front? It's it's forty five minutes, so I'm up there for the better part of an hour, mm-hmm. and continuing on and you know trying to while not letting that distract me, you know, keep on talking about the subject, continue to try to make it engaging, and then bring the focus back on to not me but to the subject matter that I'm talking about. Right. To keep everybody engaged in that while there is something happening that's obviously more interesting than most of what I have to say. So it's it's definitely (laughs) an an interesting challenge when that sort of stuff happens. But I think that's what makes people want to listen to you, though, is that is not being distracted by the things that are obvious distractions. Yeah. And being so into your message and so into what you're saying that everybody wants to listen. And I've been in an audience when you've been preaching where there's been a distraction and you just keep going and it it's like everybody deserves the message the message matters more than anything else and i'm going to deliver it to the best of my ability no matter what is going on and that's to me so respectable and i just enjoy it. this makes me listen more well that's so, awesome that's good to hear yeah that's it works and you know in in the long run it's also really great for if there is you know a situation like that it's also really good for the families. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things that that I hear the most is, you know, if uh, if a parent has a child that is distracting, knowing that it didn't throw me off right. makes them feel better about the whole situation. Because if it does something, because that's the biggest fear, right? If a baby starts crying that mm-hmm. it's going to distract, you know, whoever's at the front, whoever's speaking, whether it's me, whether it's at a, a, a seminar or something like that, that now I've ruined the seminar, I've ruined the conference because I've distracted you know, the, the speaker that everybody's here listening to. And when you're able to stay on topic, stay on target and, you know, talk to them afterwards, I make it a point to go and and to talk to those people and say, Hey, you know, thanks, thanks for bringing your kid out. It was, it was really fun. This, you know, I'm sorry that they cried during the thing, but you know, I'm glad that you brought them and, you know, thankful that you're here. Mm -hmm. It makes them feel better. And then knowing that it didn't throw you off your game, it, it just really creates a a community around, you know, what you're doing in the subject matter. And especially when we're talking about um, our faith and, and the Christian belief, when we're able to create that community and just show people that we love them and that we're, um, you know, caring about them as a, a person that we care about their family. It just, it goes a really long way. So it's a lot yeah. of fun. Well, you're speaking of family, maybe, maybe go back to earlier in your life. Cause you, yeah. you had not only the family growing up like everyone does, mm-hmm. you know, but you also shifted to a, a different family on the road. Yes. In music. So I'm curious to one, how did you get into music? how did you get in the band? And you traveled to some interesting places. I or, have. And it wasn't like a, one and done thing. Right. You know, you, you spent quite a bit of time away from, quote, home, mm-hmm. but you had a, a kind of family band. I think you and Danley were on tour. Yeah, for yeah, a yeah. While, yeah, Danley so. and I were together for, for a while. Yeah, so walk us through through that that part of your life. I mean, how did oh, you get man. into music and then uh, how did you wind up touring? Yeah, so I, I got into music when I was really young. I love, I've always loved music from a young age. I think the first time I performed on stage, I was singing. I was like age five or six at a talent show. Do you have a video of that? Um, we, we might. Uh, our house burned down, so we lost oh. a lot of those home videos when I was about 14, which oh. my mom regrets, but I don't. So <laughs> it's one of those one of those weird things. I lost a bunch of Ninja Turtles, which I hated, I hated that, but I don't mind that some of the home <laughs> the videos are gone. The trade-off, though. It's okay yeah, now. Yeah, it's a, it's a good balance. Um, but I've loved music since I was a little kid. Uh, my mom sang. I I loved singing. Uh, my dad was a bass player, which I didn't find out until I was later in grade school. 
um, my mom worked uh, overnight shifts for a police department doing uh, doing records, and um, my dad worked during the day, and so he would stay up late at night. And when I got older, I would uh, stay up with him and, and wait for mom to come home. And they would, you know, spend a little time together. Well, one night, dad came out and he was playing this bass guitar. I loved it. I thought it was just the coolest thing that I'd ever seen. And um, just listening to him play for, for probably about 10, 20 minutes before he sent me to bed was an amazing experience for me. And so I knew that somewhere along the lines, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to play bass. You know, I'd seen it. I'd fallen in love with it watching my dad do it. And so that was one of those things that I was like, all right, I definitely want to do this. In junior high, I played saxophone because I felt like it was the coolest instrument that you could play, <laughs> even though the the embouchure, the way that you have to hold your mouth to do it, has left like my bottom lip scarred. Like since junior <laughs> high, it's I got this terrible callus on the bottom of it. But um, when I got into high school, I ended up having the opportunity to play bass. So we got some money for Christmas, and I bought my bass guitar. Uh, then our house burned down. And the one thing that I got that survived was the base. The case had melted to the base. We had to go to the neighbor's house and cut it out. And uh, we took it over to the music shop, and they had to uh, replace some of the hardware on it. But all in all, the base survived. It's like God and protected yeah, it exactly. just for you. So there was, there was part of me that felt like that was exactly it. you know. So I'm, I started to learn how to play, had a natural ability for it, was playing some at church. And what really kind of turned the corner of music for me was – one of the the songwriters for Leanne Rhymes, who wrote some of her hits on the album Blue, was at Great uh, album, our church. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So Ron Grimes was there. He was at our church and heard me playing a worship band and was like, hey, I'm working with a couple of artists. Would you be interested in doing some bass work? That was at 15 at the time. I was like, what, what are you talking about? He goes, you know, I, I have a, a studio at home. I'm working with some um, some upcoming artists. So what what I do is I record them there, and then we send their demo tapes off to to Nashville. Fun. And and uh, he's working with all kinds of different musical genres. There were country music. We had um, some Afro American music, which was really cool. There were some funk albums that I got to work on. It was just it was this really amazing um, just time for me musically. And so we ended up. Um, working at a deal where I would go to school and then uh, I would come home. I would listen to a couple of tracks on CDs. I would write bass parts for them. And then mom and dad would take me to the studio around 6 o'clock. And I would track from like 6 to 7.30 or 6 to 8. And then I would go home, do homework, and then we'd start it again the next day. And, mm. and so that was really what got me started into into studio work. And I actually kind of made a little bit of a name for myself doing that, which was a, just a ton of fun. And it was kind of this anomaly because I'm a 15-year-old kid, and I'm playing on these, these demo tapes. And these artists that I'm playing for are well-established in the Dallas scene. And they're people that everybody is you know talking about, about going places. Um, I got to play with uh, a few different R&B and rap artists, which was a lot oh, of fun. And fun. so when we're going to like the studios that are in like South Oak Cliff mm -hmm. and, you know, walking in and I'm, I'm didn't look much different than I do now, except for I couldn't grow a beard, you know, <laughs> but I have a long hair, just scrawny, um, lily white blonde kid going in and, and these, you know, this whole group of, of producers and they've got guys from LA that are part of, um, you know, bad boy records and all these different, you know, huge music groups that are looking at like, all right, the little white kid is going to play bass for us. And we had guys that would vouch and like, just let him go. There's your nickname, the little white guy. Well, so that is, that was one of the areas where I got the nickname Pookie because they didn't know what to call me. So, um, <laughs> so I would go in and I would, I would play on these albums. We, we just had a, an absolute blast. And so I, I ended up playing in some bands locally that ended up having, um, you know, really great local success and when we got to kind of the next level some things fell apart we had a record deal with columbia that fell apart when i was mm -hmm. in my late teens and then that is is really when i focused on bodybuilding after losing you know that um that record deal i felt you know maybe i want to focus back on athletics so won the uh the mr southwest competition in 2005 and that was followed by an, an ankle injury i went in and was trying out um for a local college team and tour for the six outer ligaments in my left ankle. And so it was going to be a long process and nine to 10 months. And since I was going in as a walk on, it mm -hmm. was just, it wasn't going to be something that the team was really going to take care of. They didn't have any obligation to me. So I didn't know what to do. And, so, and music had still been on my heart. It's something that I, I really wanted. So I got a call to, 
to come in and, and to do some studio stuff for a guy that had heard about me and I hadn't picked up the bass in about a year. And I was like, all right, you know, fine. I'll, I'll give it a shot, whatever. Um, and when I got there, I had just the best experience with the guys that we were doing music with. Um, Danley was one of them who is, uh, the, the other host on the Reverend and the reprobate show. And we had a, we had just a ton of fun writing, playing music together. And soon we formed our own thing. So we did, um, a band, we started a band called Crimson Fall, which was, um, primarily heavy metal, which was something that at that point I hadn't really done a lot of. We got to write a lot of songs and through that we met a lot of different people, um, ended up going on some tours and the way that we got on those tours was we it it was sneaky (laughs) so we found this band that we liked playing with it was a band called disciple they were phenomenal they had a huge following and we got on opening for them in a local show in dallas so what i did after that i knew that they were going to houston next so i called ahead to the club in houston that they were going to and said hey uh we just opened for them in dallas do you have an opening spot you know, we, we'd love to open for them again. We won't charge you anything. Just let us, you know, sell merch. And they were like, yeah, absolutely. So we go and we open for them in Houston. Well, then they're going to East Texas. Well, I call the club in East Texas <laughs> and ask the club in East Texas if they know that we're coming. <laughs> so now I'm doing the assumptive close. And they were like, what? And I was like, yeah, we joined this tour in Dallas. Did they tell you that we're coming? And they said, well, no. And I was like, well, you know, we need we don't need billing, but we just need you to know that we're going to be here. You're going to need to set up an extra merch table. And so for the next six weeks, this is what we did on Fridays and Saturday nights. I would call ahead and we would schedule the time. You know, That's I would work deceitful. out with that. Oh, but it works so well. <laughs> and so after I, I guess yeah, how after how long did it take before they realized this? So after the second week, their manager is this guy named Lee Fields. Lee pulls me aside and he goes, hey, kid, what are you doing? Y'all are following us around from place to place. We'd actually made some friends with with the guys in the band, though we were trying to keep our distance because we didn't, you know, the jig was going to be up soon. Um, and I told him exactly what we're doing. He's like, "All right, it's genius, but you got to cut it out because we're off the road. Like we're catching a flight out of Jackson, Mississippi, so you can't follow us after that." I'm like, okay, so we did. We followed him for several weeks, made it there, and and that is kind of how throughout the South we sort of grew our name. And Lee and some others just thought that what I had done was creative enough and and crazy enough that they they admired it and so in the you know the following years um when stuff would pop up or they needed somebody to sub in they were like oh you know what was that goofy kid in dallas that like (laughs) booked his own band on our tour so they would call me to to come in and do sub stuff and eventually sub you know playing bass for a guy that you know broke his arm or whatever turned into getting on a couple of pop tours um, and then getting to tour around the United States and then, uh, between working with bands and then working with an evangelistic group that I was with, I've been on, uh, five different continents and in uh, something crazy, like, like 25 different countries and in every state, but Alaska. And so it's just been a, a crazy wild ride. Best place outside of the United States that you've visited. Oh man, that's tough. Um, okay. Strangest. Okay, well, strangest are the uh, the Visited catacombs. Or played? The the catacombs in Paris, France, I think, are the strangest. Okay. So underneath Paris, they have the catacombs where they they stored all the bodies of people during the plagues and, and the Christians during some of the times when um, you know Christians were under persecution. And so underneath France, if you go through, there are mazes that are just nothing but bones of people. Oh. And in the middle of these weird mazes are these beautiful sculptures that the monks did of like the city of Jerusalem and, uh, you know, what Paris looked like through the ages and all kinds of stuff. It's just beautiful artwork, but it's very ominous because, mm-hmm. you know, you're, I mean, it's a, it's a seven foot ceiling, so it's very close. Mm-hmm. And you're surrounded by skulls and bones of actual people. And there's certain parts that are blocked off because if you um, if you stay down in the catacombs too long, there's people that get lost and die in there all the time. So they've actually got places that are blocked off that you can't go. They've got specific tours to go through. But yeah, people it's, try to go it's through crazy. Anyway, right? Yeah. Yeah. People will, will try to go through. But, they'll, I mean, they're finding new bodies in there all the time. It's it's one of the eeriest mm-hmm. places that I've ever been. But it was so, so cool, the catacombs so you ever been to Turkey? I've not been to Turkey. Oh, I, I want to go with the uh, underground churches. No, no. So 
Um, I've heard about the underground churches in Turkey, but I haven't gotten the opportunity Been to there. see them. Been yeah? there, done that. Yes. Found out I'm claustrophobic. Oh, uh, yeah? <laughs> not, yes. There was a – went in to, to check it out, and so there's like these little narrow pathways uh-huh. where I don't think I could get through it today. Right. You know, you're going like sideways. And then you go into this big room where that's where they would do their study mm-hmm. and their uh-huh. prayer, right? Well, you are you know, you go in, you follow the guy in front of you, and you're like, okay, sneak it through there. It's okay, it's a little tight, right? But I'm fine. We get in, and of course, you forget that there's like 15 other people behind you. Right. So then now the room that looks kind of like this size, all of a sudden <laughs> is like, and you realize there's only one way out, and there's 14 people between me and that And the door? Exit. So oh, man. the whole time that... The guy was kind of talking about stuff. I didn't hear anything he said because I was slowly making my way back to be the first one out of there. <laughs> so yeah, that was uh, that's quite quite interesting. Turkey, huh? All right, I'll have to put that on the list. Turkey I shot Sism there one year. Nice. Yeah, military world championships and uh, yeah, that's so cool. put down your list. I won't be joining you. I've been there uh, once. You, I want to go back. You done that? Got the T-shirt? You're you're over it, huh? Yeah, I got Turkey off my list, and you know I've been to Hungary too. So you mentioned yeah. Honduras, well, I've been to Hungary, so, you know, if you're interested in being hungry and go to Turkey, knock out both. There you go. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So then when did you move from music, because you kind of stopped music and yeah. then shifted over to ministry, or yeah, did so you go I went, back to competition after your, your injury healed? No, so I went from music to the mission field. Um, so I, I was on a tour in 2009 uh, with a worship artist named Wes Butler, who's now working for uh, David Crowder. He's doing stuff with Crowder. And um, we we had gone up. We did kind of a Southwest tour and then ended up finishing in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains up in a, a city called Cold Spring, California. Mm-hmm. And we we played a camp there for a little bit, drove back down. The drummer from that band gave me a call about a year later. We're mm-hmm. we're talking about you know what it is that that he's been doing. He goes, look, I've been working at a church in Canada. We are are looking for some fresh faces to bring up here. We're trying to get some of the churches in the area to work together, and uh, we we really are looking for somebody that wants to work with middle schoolers. I didn't have a tour or anything lined up at the time. I'd just gotten off of one where I was doing some camps again in, in 2010. And so I, I prayed about it a little bit and just felt like I had kind of released to do whatever I wanted. You know, this mm-hmm. was obviously a, a path and option that was open. And so if I wanted to take it, I just felt the freedom to do that. So from the moment I got that call until uh, I left was only about six weeks. So it was, you know, ramping up, getting, you know, passports and visas and um, making sure that, you know, I had the title to my truck so that I could actually drive up to Canada or else, you know, I wouldn't be able to keep the car there long term and, you know, kind of working out how I would be funded and all of that happened mm-hmm. in a very, very, very short amount of time. So I ended up in Canada doing ministry work and actually ended up playing a lot while I was up there because, you know, I took my bass. I knew that there would be some times where I would want to play. And so I ended up playing the worship bands up there, uh, did a couple of dinner theaters where we were playing jazz music, which was a lot of fun. Um, the Charlie, we did a Charlie Brown Christmas special, which is maybe some of the most difficult music that I've ever played. If you've ever listened to the Charlie Brown soundtracks, mm-hmm. the trio that does that, those guys are just out of this world, brilliant musicians. Um, and so we, we got to do some of that, but I really got to dive into not just a different culture, but what ministry was like day in and day out. I'd always kind of been one that, you know, we, we came in on a Monday or a Tuesday and then, you know, did ministry for a week and then we were on to the next thing. So it was always meeting new people and, you know, on to, you know, the next thing. And so you kind of, you tell the same stories and you start over and you sort of meet everybody at the same starting spot. Well, going through life with somebody day to day is a lot more challenging from a ministerial standpoint, mm-hmm. you know, if you just go in and you, you tell a cool story or, or share something that, you know, that one moment is really impactful, but then you can go to the next city and do the same thing. Well, if somebody's already heard that story and they're continuing to make bad decisions now, you know, what's the next thing that you do? What's the next step of that process? And I really wish that I'd been equipped with the mental management tools back then because mm-hmm. I would have known, you know, here are some things that, that I can do to try to reshape you know, what is working and what's not working with these students. But likewise, here's some tools that I can give them to navigate some of the issues that they're going through. And um, 
the day-to-day ministry of it, I really just, I fell in love with the grind mm-hmm. and, and getting to, to talk to students, to build relationships, um, to work on community projects and things like that. And so that year in Canada really, it, it really changed my heart as far as what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. I'd never thought about investing in a community. Mm-hmm. Everything that I had done to that point was all about getting to the next cool experience. And that year in Canada really just reshaped the way that I saw ministry and that I saw my my personal trajectory. And so when I came home from that, I had no idea what I was going to do. So I got uh, I got three different jobs so that I could just kind of work off some of the debt that I had. I was getting up at, at four in the morning so that I could be at Starbucks by 430. I would work at Starbucks and then go straight to Discount Tire and change tires. And then after that, I was the the afternoon and evening manager at a Harley shop. Oh and I was goodness. working there. And so I had all these things. No wonder th- you chose Starbucks. Things. Yeah. yeah, I had all <laughs> these different things that I was juggling. And so I, I went from one to the next to the next and, you know, was getting really good at, at working off debt, but I was burning out. And not only that, I wasn't really doing anything that I felt like, though the jobs were fun, I wasn't really doing anything that I felt like was really having an impact and was really meaningful. And so that's when I started studying worldviews and, you know, how is it that uh, a person that is, you know, making coffee or that's changing tires or, you know, that's selling parts at a a Harley shop or managing Mm -hmm. the service department, how can you have an impact for your faith there? You know, how can I have an impact Mm -hmm. for the gospel in these places and started learning about different tactics that I can use in order to just bring up um, faith in conversation and, and begin to have a ministry there. And as that started to happen, I got a call from the guy who was the pastor here, the former pastor is now the pastor emeritus, Dr. Ben Smith, mm-hmm. who asked me whether or not I'd be interested in um, coming and, and really subbing in one Sunday and helping out with the youth. So I said, you know what, I haven't done anything like that in a while, but I'll give it a shot. And uh, I just, day one, came in, um, taught a Sunday school lesson, and fell in love with the students that were here because it was like the little island of, of you know, broken toys. toys. Yeah, the <laughs> Misfit Toys Island. It, it really was. And the Now thing, you know why Sydney fit in. Yeah, well, the, the thing that I loved about it is that I fit in. Mm-hmm. You know, I fit into we're that group. We're all misfits, because, really. Yeah, yeah. I, I had this, this eclectic past of all of these different things that I'd done. There was no real main focus. You know, there's so much pressure when you're in high school, they're like, you know, what's your passion? What's mm-hmm. the one thing that you want to do? And then you get into college. And I had a perfect, still have a perfect 4.0 grade average in college for my first two years of college. Those credits can transfer anywhere, I think, at least for another couple of years. But I never knew what I wanted to do. And so college for me was was becoming a waste of money because I was going and I was succeeding, but I was aimless. Mm-hmm. And and that was the most dangerous thing that I could be in. So I took these aptitude tests that are supposed to tell you like, all right, here's what you're supposed to do. So I sit down, I take the aptitude test. I sit down with my advisor and I'm like, all right, so what does it say in that? The advisor looks at me and goes, well, you can kind of do whatever you want. And I was like, that's the worst thing that you can tell a kid that's aimless right now is that I can do whatever I want. And so whatever I wanted at the time was to go on tour. And so that's what I did. So I felt a connection to those students because I was in the same boat is that I was the, you know, I felt like I was captaining the ship of Misfit Toys and we were trying to find our way back to the island, you know, or, or to the mainland. And uh, I just, I fell in love with, with the students, with the work that we were doing. Um, we had goth kids and preppy kids and funny kids and a couple of athletes and everybody, you know, we, we all just got along and accepted each other where we were at. And, and the church was made up primarily of really young people, you know, mm-hmm. being the youth group and um, senior citizens. And so those are typically the two groups that have the most conflict in churches mm-hmm. because they're the two groups that understand each other the least. Right. You know, the old people are, you know, those freaking kids are ruining everything. And the kids are like, well, they just don't understand me. OK, boomer. And so <laughs> yeah. what we what we did is we we implemented this system where. Um, our job as the youth group every Sunday was that we were going to sing the loudest. We were going to worship louder than anybody else. And that during the meet and greet time, we were each going to find three senior citizens and we were going to give them a hug. It Mm. didn't matter. It didn't matter what, you know, we thought about them or anything. So our, our motto for the youth group was that we were going to sing loud and hug an old person every chance (laughs) we got. 
And that really in our church, and this comes from what I was doing in Canada, the sense of community started to grow because when the students are going and seeking out the seniors to let them know that they see them, that they love them, that they care that they're there, it really does a lot to break down those walls. Mm -hmm. And so we started to see this uh, skip generational mentoring and ministry start to happen as you know, our, our 80 year olds that are on our building committee that are doing things around the church are calling now the 17 year olds to come in to help them. Mm -hmm. And they're teaching them skills and they're working with them on, you know, the, the projects that we have up at the church. And now several of those students are not only in ministry themselves, but they've used those skills and are now construction foremen and things mm -hmm. like that because they had the same experience that I did. You know, they got into, into high school and didn't know what they wanted to do and got into college and were aimless. And yet, you know, the stuff that they loved were the things that they did with those old guys when they were working on the electrical work at the church or when they were, you know, tearing down walls for a remodel. And so now that's what they're doing. They're running heavy equipment and, and they've become really productive and, and leaders and businesses in those ways. And it all comes from the community that was created at the church because God made it very clear that, you know, if you if you love God, you love other people and then your heart is focused on service that he can do amazing things. And so that's just really what we doubled down on and um, that's, you know, it wasn't, but a few years later that, um, Ben decided to retire and the church asked if I would, I would step up and take that role. And so that's how the journey has got me here. And I got to say out of everything that I've done from all the competitions that I've done, which have been so much mm -hmm. fun music, which I loved travel, which, you know, just really speaks to the vagabond that's in my heart. Uh, being a pastor is not only the most challenging, but it's also the most fun thing that I've ever done because it's afforded me so many opportunities. I still get to play music whenever I want to play. I get to play with the, the band and help out creatively with that team. Uh, we've created a podcasting studio that we're able to reach out to the community and help community members create their own podcast and get information about their businesses and things out of there. But likewise, I get to meet and talk to people, again, that I have no business talking to. And so much of it now, when I look at all of the different projects that we're managing, goes back to the stuff that I learned you know, now three years ago in with winning in mind, because we've created processes that now feed into our strategies whenever we're gaming and wherever, you know, when game day comes or when the events come or, or whatever they were able to run. We take those things and evaluate them and it leads back into the process. And as we're able to take this model and equip other people with it, well, now, you know, our leadership pipeline is now filling with people that can confidently go into stuff because they've researched well, they've prepared well for things. So they're able on the day of, you know, an event or a competition or when they're going up and preaching themselves or when they're going into the community and making presentations or whatever they're in their businesses. And when they're in their businesses, they have those opportunities to share the gospel or whatever they've been prepared. They're confident in those. And so they've got everything that they need so that their subconscious, their conscious, their self image are all ready to go. And they're completely equipped to go and do the work that they need to do. And that has really shaped the way that we do the business of the church has shaped the way that we do the ministry here. It shaped every different angle of our outreach and the way that we impact the community and the work that we do with the community. It's just been a phenomenal model to get to see how it applies to, to everything else and to see the fruit of that, not only as I'm learning more of it, but passing it down to uh, to our leaders and, and watching them pass it on. It's just been absolutely incredible. That's so exciting to see with winning in mind being used in so many different ways and yeah. what we teach being utilized in so many different ways. That's really fun. It's, it's been a blast. So I'm, I'm very much in y'all's debt and, and also to your dad for, uh, for not just, you know, producing such great material and making it so accessible, but also for the time that we've got to have those discussions and, and the mentoring and the one-to-one -one stuff that I know that you guys do. And I know that y'all advertise that on, on your side. And, and luckily for me, I've got a good enough relationship with you that um, most of the time all it costs me is a lunch <laughs> to, uh, to get some of that coaching. But the one-on-one -on -one coaching has been some of the most in incredible pieces of, I, I, I really guess, just gleaning off of that experience to yeah. to be able to further what it is that that we're doing and I, I don't know if if that's something that that your audience is has done or if they're into but the the one-on-one -on -one coaching stuff man I I can't say enough how important that has been mm -hmm. Them because somebody that understands the system that you can bounce ideas off of, but they can also show you, hey, you know what? You didn't exactly journal this, right? You know, you put this in a needs work area. This is actually a positive thing, or you put this in a positive and this is a needs work area. 
those kind of things and changing your perspective on it, that one-to-one coaching is, is absolutely invaluable and, and really does make all the difference in the world. Yeah, and try, trying to figure out why we can – because what you're hitting on is transformation. Yeah. You, know, you can get information from the book, but how do I take what I, I understand, tweak it to where I can really – grow in the area that I want and really transform what I'm doing. Yeah. That's what one on coaching can provide for you. We're looking at, at ways right now of creating that more to the masses and that kind mm-hmm. of stuff with technology. It's growing in that area. And so when you look, go back to what you're hitting on, you know, the performance model, I, I say this a lot to Heather. It's like <laughs> the, the genius that what our dad came up with was this performance model. You know, how the conscious, subconscious, self-image work together to generate performance. And what we're learning today is it really applies to everything you do we say yeah. it, but here's an individual that has literally used it in many parts of his life in some cases didn't realize it till later and now it's like look i cannot go into this scenario or situation without having proper preparation conscious you mm-hmm. know building the skill because if i don't i can't trust it when i do it mm-hmm. and then properly evaluating it and building the self-image that i can do this and i can do it successfully so what would you like to say to close us out heather on this uh podcast I, I just find it, I always find it to be fascinating to talk to somebody who I know, but I don't know, right? Yeah. I mean, like, I know Lucas as far as I've seen him preach. I've been here at the church. I, I know him, <laughs> but I feel I told him when we first started, it feels like he's like a cat with nine lives because he just keeps doing more things. I don't think you ever died, though. Like, it's okay. No, not yet. But, um, yeah. but I don't know what life we're on technically in your, right. in your I don't know, transformation of I'm, what I'm is going to do. I'm hoping we're still early on. You know, I hope I'm, so. I'm hoping the best is to come. I hope so. But I think you're doing what you were intended to do yeah. with your life. And everything, it seems to me like everything that you've done in your life has acted as preparation for what you're doing now. And you're investing in people and you're sharing God's word. And it's just incredibly inspiring to me. And I'm just grateful that we've been a small part of your journey recently. And I just want to welcome everyone to take the time to like our channel, to Wait, subscribe to our channel, like this particular episode, and join us next week.